All right, Tabitha, thank you very much for uh, for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah. All uh, right, before or during for you during the players. Um, since the Olympic Games, uh, I guess what have you been doing curling wise? Just practice, really individually. Um, we haven't gotten together as a team since the Olympics. We kind of just took the time off. It was kind of just a lot leading up to it, as anyone can imagine. So yeah, like Tara and I've been practicing together in the cities, and then um, Becca played in the mixed doubles. Right. And one, so she's headed to Switzerland after the Players' Championship, and then she'll come home for like a day and go to the Champions Cup. So busy spring for her. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's good to be back together playing as a team. I'll bet it's good to be back together. That's about five weeks off or something, yeah. so, which is a Longer long time. Longer than we would have liked, really, right. but... Yeah. Of course. Uh, let's get into um, maybe how you got into curling a little bit. Um, uh, how did you get into it? Um, where and at what age? Mm-hmm. I was about 10. And the reason we started um, was because my family's Canadian. So my, my mom is Canadian. So her dad, my grandpa, played in Canada for a little bit. And then he moved down to the cities, played up on the Iron Range for many years. Um, whoa, but, whoa, hang on. Iron Range. Oh, I northern Minnesota. Oh, okay. Hibbing. Really? You've been there. Eveleth. Yeah, That's the Iron Range. It's called the Iron Range? Yeah. What? Yeah. Anyway, yes, I've been anyway, to Eveleth. So, yeah, so why? why? I go, let's go off. <laughs> uh, let's go uh, crooked here. Why is it called the Iron Range? What's well, it? there's mining and stuff. So okay. I think I think that's why. Oh, all right. I'm I, not from there, so okay. But yeah, so my grandpa played, and then um, never taught any of his daughters. It was my mom and three other kids. So they, we all went down at the same time to the St. Paul Curling Club when I was about ten, and my family and us three kids, we all tried it. And got involved in the junior program, and you know, there loved we go. it. And here you are, yeah, so. all these years later. Mm-hmm. Huh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, in the U.S. right now, um, maybe you try to explain what's going on with the growth of mm-hmm. the sport in the U.S. And maybe, maybe not just not just the incredible growth, but why? What's 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 going on? Mm-hmm. It is really cool to see. Um, I guess I don't know specific numbers, but it seems like, especially after every Olympic cycle. Every curling club gets just hit with learn to curls and corporate events. And so in terms of growing the game, that's huge. Just getting people in the door and trying it. Um, And then, of course, it's getting some of those people to join leagues and, you know, play more than just one time. So and just seeing clubs um, kind of all over the country now, you know, in warmer climates like Arizona and Florida and California now. It's just really cool to see it growing and um, these dedicated facilities popping up. So um, I think it's awesome, um, but I think we we can grow it even more and try to get it not just when it's popular with the Olympics, kind of get more sustainable growth. So yeah, one thing I notice um, when I go to the clubs, and I, I go to the clubs in, in the U.S. quite a lot, mm-hmm. actually, mm-hmm. Um, the excitement of the player is different than in Canada. If you come to the club in Canada, uh, it we have many clubs. Like almost every town in their entire country has a curling club. Um, and they take their game very seriously and, and love it. Um, very passionate. Yeah. In the States, they're passionate too. But in a very energetic and excited way. Like, <laughs> um, if you walk into a club, everybody's wearing their club shirt. Yeah. Or their club hat. Yeah. Or, or their pin, their name tag with the club on it. And Yeah. Yeah, I I guess, how's that, why, I guess, why is it so different? Maybe it's because, like, as a kid, my dad always curled, so I was sitting at the table when I was six years old, and you get all this curling information kind of through osmosis. You just, there's nothing you do about it, you're going to know how to skip the game by the time you're seven or eight, because it's just, (laughs) that's what you talk about at the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. But maybe in, maybe in the U.S., it isn't like that. Learning it as an adult more. Right. Rather than learning it as a, as a kid. I just, I'm just wondering your thoughts mm-hmm. on that because I think it's really good. Mm-hmm. Like I love going into the clubs and it's, it's a, it, it's a party atmosphere 24 um, seven. I think, I think that's healthy. Yeah, I do too. You know, I played in a, a fun spiel in the middle of March too at the Frogtown Curling Club, which is also a club in St. Paul. And it was a very fun environment it just is like everyone is just super into it but it's not just about the curling it's about making friends and kind of having this sense of club and community kind of like you said feeling a part of something so you got this big growth going no question about that i guess my next question is how how do we get the u.s high performance program growing at the same rate as curling is uh Mm -hmm. it is doing well well Mm -hmm. your thoughts on the high performance program first of all 
and the growth in the youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've definitely tried to focus or I guess allocate more funds to, uh, they call it a developmental group, like a D group, um, and just to get more good curlers kind of in that pipeline. Because, yeah, we have two, three good teams in men's and women's side, but it'd be nice to have more competitive teams. And I think the way you get that is if you get them good when they're younger and get them just more exposed to the game and just playing lots. And, you know, sometimes you can't do that without money, frankly, because then it's on the parents and, and you know, so it's it's tough. But, um, you know, we have as USA Curling as a whole. We've changed a lot of things in the last couple of years, you know, with a new CEO, we have a lot of new staff. And so I think we're trying to kind of morph things in a way to keep up and, and get more growth too. Yeah. If you're a young kid who loves the game, say in Seattle, um, are there training camps for that young player? If it, say it's a, a guy who's 15 years mm-hmm. old, um, how, in, in real life. So this kid loves the game and I know a couple of them. And so I guess, how do they, they go what to Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are a, f- a few, but yes, <clears throat> you'll probably have to travel to the Midwest. Like in terms of like a local, I don't know how much there is of that. That's what I was wondering yeah. about a training camp situation for teams yeah. from the West versus, because it's a big mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. So from the East or Deep South, as mm-hmm. you're saying, now there's clubs in Deep South. So as soon as you get all these clubs in all these various locations, obviously uh, X amount of young people are going to love our game because it's a cerebral game. If you're really good at math, if you're really good at physics, this is the kind of game for mm-hmm. you. So you're going to get these kids that love this sport. Wow. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Now what? And that, that's always my worry. And um, finding, you know, good coaches or good people that can teach them the right way. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. So how is that going with coaching and, uh, and instruction in the U.S.? Because that's, that's an important one. Mm-hmm. I know that that's why I'm down there. When I do come down, I usually do schools and stuff. But mm-hmm. how many, I guess, is that looked after? <laughs> like from Not not just uh, USCA either. Yeah. It doesn't have to be just the, the Curling Association yeah. that does this stuff. I mean, if you just look at like what I'm exposed to in terms of the clubs that I go to, it seems like there are a lot of adults volunteering their time Saturday mornings or whatever for the junior program. So, yes, but I guess I don't know how structured it is and what they're teaching them and you know is it just technique and go out and have fun or is it strategy so I guess I'm not sure but it's it's all volunteer right okay. so is, is there a national training center in the U.S.? Technically it's Chaska that's oh, okay. our yep so we train off ice at the training house which is the Minnesota Vikings facility in Egan Minnesota and then our ice official training site is the Chaska club. So, so the Chaska Club's a gorgeous club. It is. For anybody it's beautiful. That hasn't been there. It's yeah. new. Um, there's talks. I don't know how much public information this is, but to get an on-site ice arena um, at the Training House, the Vikings Complex campus, there's talks of building something there. But oh, that's nice. probably, I don't know, oh, three, four, or five, or whatever years away. But yeah, yeah. Oh, that that's, would, that's the ideal dream, I guess, to kind of have it all in one spot. You know? I guess the trick with Chaska, uh, it's just such a busy place. It is, yeah. It's it's got a gorgeous, for anybody that doesn't know uh, Chaska Curling Club, I I love the place. It's got a sports bar at the one end that's not just, a lot of the curling clubs, um, the bar is just for the curling members, really. But it's not like that there. Mm -hmm. The whole community comes. Yeah, you just go there for brunch. And then you're like, oh, we can watch curling. (laughs) Yeah, they have great wine. And (laughs) And there's an event center attached. They do weddings and all that too. So yeah, it's it's a beautiful facility. But in terms of, just sheer distance from the Vikings facility, it's a good 45-minute drive. So not ideal if you're trying to do both in one day. <laughs> right, not, no, but, but still pretty darn good with excellent ice conditions. Oh, yes. Um, let's dive into uh, a little bit with the Olympics and uh, the, the tiebreaker scenario. I mm-hmm. want to hear your thoughts on, on mm-hmm. that because, you know, for Jennifer Jones, I, you know, I haven't talked to her about it yet, but I'm sure, you know, she'll have something to say about it. But, but more, I'm not worried about each team individually, but, but actually losing out of something like the Olympic Games mm-hmm. with the same record as somebody else. And it's just the last, sh- uh, the, the draw shot challenge. I mean, we know how important the draw shot is because of situations like this. I mean, even in some slam events and other events, if it's pool play, like the draw shot is a factor. So 
you know, we that's kind of part of our thing is like that's so important. So we have to tailor our practice around to getting a very low draw shot because it matters. It matters a lot, not only for hammer, but for seating and everything. So, so how do you do your practice that can help you with that? Um, lots of draws. We hardly throw any hits. It's just trying to break down the pads around the draws, <laughs> which I guess then you play the first down. You're like, we have no idea what this path is doing. So it's, you know, give or take, but that's kind of what we've done. I guess I don't know a hundred percent where we are in the standings for the draw shot, but, um, but yeah, I, and then just in terms of, it's just a different format at the Olympics than a world championships, you know, with the straight semi and final versus page, but it's, you know, in ice time, it's TV time. It's all this extra stuff. If you're going to play a tiebreaker game for those playoff spots. Right. So, from the, from the governing body yeah, side of things, yeah. how do you, how do you organize mm-hmm. such a thing with, with that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to ask you about playoff systems. Cause you just said that one playoff system is different from another and a different from another. Whereas a lot of sports tend to have the same type of a way to crown the champ. Um, you mean similar across all events? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> For the most part, you know, yeah, you have a certain way mm-hmm. of of getting to the playoffs. Okay, mm-hmm. we're in the playoffs. And then a certain way of getting through to mm-hmm. getting your champion. Mm-hmm. Um, curling's not quite like that. Because mm-hmm. you, when you come to events, I imagine you probably have to look at the rules yeah, of play. Yeah, every time. <laughs> well, right, yeah. right? So you, you come to a certain event. and you, oh, So what's the playoffs going to be like this time? Mm-hmm. And, and like for this one, it's triple knock. Your draw shot doesn't matter. So you're just going to get hammer. Um, but yes, and then eight ends, 10 ends. Like there's, everything is just so different. Like you said, from event to event. I don't know if that's good or bad. Do we want it a little more streamlined and the same for teams and TV? I don't know. But it's something to think about. It's just something interesting when, when, you, when you're talking about coming to an event and you got to look at the rule book to say, okay, are we playing eight ends or 10 ends? <laughs> Uh, is it a round robin or is it a double knockout or is it yeah. a triple knockout? Is yeah. it this or is it that? Um, there's always back, back in the day, uh, triple knock. Some people were really good at triple knockouts. Some people were really good at round robins. Um, I always liked round robin. Play. Mm. A guy by the name of like, Kerry Burtnick has an old name from curling and he was so good at triple knockouts. He almost <laughs> never came out of a, he'd stumble <laughs> around a, B, C, yeah. and then he'd get going. Then you get going and watch And then out. you play more games than the A qualifiers, like three, four more games. So you know the ice better. You know the ice better. You've played <laughs> with more sets of rocks. You've played on every sheet. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, that's true. That's exactly, exactly yeah. the way it is. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I want to talk about uh, is the length of events. Um, uh, the World Championships just, just finished up in Vegas. Uh, 15 games, I think, for the for the winners yeah. to play. I remember games. last year in Calgary, I think we played 16. 16 Because there games. were 14. <clears throat> right, one more team. There was yeah. one more team, yeah. So, Oof. Like, right. Yeah. Like, your comment on that. Is, it, is there no way we can crown a champ a little sooner? Like, you're, like that, that's a lot of games in, <laughs> mm-hmm. in real life. If you're going to play that, and then to your point, Becca wins, Becca Hamilton, uh, she's going to, to the uh, mixed doubles mm-hmm. and play what? 15, 16 more games? Like, mm-hmm. how much How much uh, of this can a body take? And your thoughts on the length of events and if we can... Yeah. It, well, or are you fine with it well, the way it is? Yeah, and it's it's kind of, okay, do you add more teams and then do two pools? Or do you cut it down to 12, 11, or 10? 10, 10 at the Olympics, and then you only have nine in the round robin. Um, I don't know. There's, I guess, a lot of different ways you could change it, but what do you think it does about, seem well, long. The, well, <laughs> well let's, let's get into this a little bit. If you're going to expand the, the field mm-hmm. to X from 13 to maybe 18, but instead of playing everybody, you only play half the field in a split. Right. So what's the benefits of that, do you think? Um, I mean, I think it's good for more countries to get more exposure to the game, for sure, which is going to help to grow the game and... So that's probably the route I would choose versus cutting it to 10. I don't know. Right. No, but those are important deci- yeah. decisions to be made because like, everybody that is going to be sitting in that chair talking about curling wants the game to grow. Mm-hmm. So how do we do that? What's mm-hmm. the best way to, to do that? And so a lot of people sit there, we'll go, well, let's cut it down to 10, but then let's have another group, a B group where there's 10. Yeah. Like, and then maybe mm-hmm. in the C group, mm-hmm. there's 10. Mm-hmm. Um, but those are definitely different ways of looking at it. But I know for sure having a 15 game or 16 for you in the bubble. Oh my goodness. That, uh, 
ah, yeah, <laughs> can we? <laughs> it's long, and I mean, you'd probably notice that a lot of teams were playing their with their alternates probably more than normal because it's a long week, you know. Right. So, like, let's give someone a rest for a game or two, and then I don't know. Okay, let's go a different direction here. Let's go back into USA curling and uh, and building your teams. Or, 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 I guess first thing, do you build your teams anymore? Is that a, like, like, is it up to us? Yeah. Do you build your? Does Tabitha build her? Team um, Peterson? mostly yes. They for a while it was kind of there's a combine and a tryout and we're going to choose teams and. It didn't work out, I think, the way they wanted it to. So it was a little bit more, we'll help you find players, but you can choose, for the most part, who you want to play with. So that's kind of where we're at right now. You get to mostly choose who you want to play with, but they kind of will help you if you need to contact people or, oh, this person has a lot of potential in juniors, like maybe you should consider that person. Um but it's it's not how it was. I, I think it was like 2004, after the 2014 games, it was, they chose who was playing with who. And now it's a little leveled out <clears> uh, <throat> a little bit more. And is that yeah. mostly for a quadrennial? Like, well, well, at the end of this season, what happens? Because, it, because yeah. it doesn't curling really work on a four-year cycle now? Yeah. So what, what, yep. what do you guys do at the end of Champions Cup? Mm-hmm. We decide what we want to do in terms of... <laughs> Are we going to play, number one? Like, we're 33, kind of at the age of having kids, and two of our players have kids. And So, number one, are we going to play? Number two, if we're going to play, who are we going to play with? Same team, or do we want to grow a whole new team? Because that's a lot of work, too. If you have two players and then you have two brand new ones, it's a lot of work versus playing with people that you know and you've played with. And it's so, yeah, lots of decisions to be made. <laughs> how about sponsorship-wise? How, how do you set it up with your sponsors as far as, is that a deal? No, I, I don't know the answer. Um, a deal made with uh, your sponsors, is that a deal with Tabitha Peterson or is it Team Peterson? How, like, how do you set up sponsorship deals in, in the U.S. I don't, like, compared to Canada? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we don't really have as near as many sponsors as all the Canadian teams, so that's pretty easy. Okay. <laughs> we, I, th- I mean, we have Hardline, and then we have um, Eileen's work. That's it. Okay, so yeah, you get a through like work. our money is like through U.S. or United States Olympic Committee, and you know, that's about it. Yeah, you know. But yes, I we could work a little harder to find some sponsors, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, I, I know Team Schuster has an agent, and so they probably have a different answer. Yeah, well, I yeah. just think it's important that people that that listen to, to to what we do here, with be it on whatever platform we're on, understand that the curling is not the same everywhere. Yeah. And how, yeah. how teams get funded, mm-hmm. and primarily yours is through the U.S. Olympic Association. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, yep. Right, for yep. your team, and that would be the same for Schuster's team, other than... Gold medals. Gold medals get you a little more sponsors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just a few sh- more. But they should, I think. Yeah, they, they, I they, think so, too. Uh, yeah, I that. think it's well-deserved. Oh, God. <laughs> um, okay. You brought up a great point of m- the alternates played more in this last world championship that, than we've seen in a long time. Mm-hmm. So I guess the question is, um, is a five-person team going to become more common? Mm-hmm. Or are we going to end up changing the game a little bit? Mm-hmm. Because we're hurting ourselves. Mm-hmm. What or because it's a good know, question. We, we can be real busy if we have six players or five players, and you just and you don't have to play as much, sure. and you can play more. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, your thoughts on that? Because I think it's really important discussion to have mm-hmm. with the way that our sports expanding. Mm-hmm. I think just the way it is right now with all the events and back to back to back to back, like Gushu, Gushu and Dean are nonstop since the Olympics. That's a lot of curling, in my opinion. But, you know, do you have a job or not? Because if that is your job, then fine. Um, So, yeah, I think that's a very valid question. Um, We like having a five-man team for the reason of we want to play in all these events because you kind of have to to keep up and to get points and get points, get invites you into these championships and all that. But at the same time, you got to work. You got to be at home and work and make money. And so... We liked having five because then we could kind of, I mean, granted the Olympic year was a little different. We kind of stayed mostly us four, but um, previous seasons, you know, Nina and Eileen both having babies. So taking time off for, for that. And so five has worked very well for us, but 
that's a good question of how it's going to be going forward. If the schedule's c- so condensed and like there's so many events and it's the season's getting longer and longer and longer, I think five is probably going to be the way that it goes. But so let's uh, segue that into uh, you play mixed doubles too. With, and there's uh, another with, discipline, with, with, yeah, with, with Joe Polo, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, so there. And uh, now mm-hmm. Joe's on one of the best teams, mm-hmm. and 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 you are. And you play mixed doubles, so that adds... Yeah, another handful of events. And so that's why I think now you're seeing teams like Laura, Walker, and Kirk that just announced, I think they're just doing mixed doubles, right? Because it's a grind. It's a lot. To do both. To do both. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and and, so, uh, and just injuries too, just your body. Like mm-hmm. you're, You start playing mixed doubles and four-person curling, there's not going to be a 45-year-old <laughs> curler anymore because <laughs> by then you're done. Your body's ripped to shreds. Yeah. Just one more thing, mm-hmm. Tabitha, before we go. And that's uh, with the USA Curling and with your team, not your team, but all the, the top high-performance teams in the U.S., um, to get, like John, in Pyeongchang to the top of the podium, um, are there uh, systems, are there uh, training systems that you guys are using to try to to get to that stage You're, like by watching other teams that are winning mm-hmm. and, and trying to set up, I guess training programs would be the right way to say it. Who can, that can increase your uh, chances of getting to the top of the podium? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess what I could say about that is just we're trying to just pull in as many resources as possible to get all the information in terms of you know everything, nutrition, fitness, um, strategy. So like, yeah, I watch a ton of curling because I think that really helps me in my game. But, you know, it's... Honestly, like I feel like it's the top teams are so they're so good and they're so close. It's kind of whoever has an on week, really, in my opinion. But I mean, you see Adine just winning everything. So <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Tiranzoni, right? So yeah, it's I mean, they're just they're so good. They hardly miss. So yeah, it's it's just a, you know, practicing and practicing and trying to get that edge, what is that edge? And what are what are teams doing that you're not doing and seeing how the game changes with new rules and how people are adapting to that with the no tick zone and, you know, um, statistics. Like there's so many things that you can do to learn and keep learning because the game is ever changing. No tick zone definitely looked like it had an effect in uh, Prince George. Uh, mm-hmm. Your thoughts mm-hmm. on it just uh, quickly because we're playing that here as well at the players. Yep. So Yep. Um, I thought it was cool. Lots, a lot more rocks in play, which is really fun to watch. And it's not so much of a, a gimme, a gimme shot, I guess, when you're tied coming home because the, you can't take the guards, you know, tick, tick, and it the ends over. So. How about the pressure on the leads? Yeah. Crazy. I, I think that's yeah. awesome. The leads yeah. of, uh, no, I don't want to be mean to a lead. <laughs> I'm a skip. So, I don't, but you know, you know, have Benny throws out turn and lob it up there couple times mm-hmm. you know and put one close to the house one far nah not now now yeah. they've got a be little on, more precision oh yeah mm-hmm. like they're sweating bullets mm-hmm. which is great <laughs> which is great That's, yeah like, uh, as a fan as a fan watching the leads now late in games in big situations oh, oh it's different mm-hmm. it's different than it's ever been and and as a fan i, I don't know i i, I I love seeing a person stand over a putt that's like three feet. That's, that's like it's not a, it's not a gimme, but it should be made. Yeah, that that draw that yeah. guard should be made. Oh, but it's a it's a long ways to the other end of a curling ice to get on that center line. So yeah, so you're it sounds like you're kind of. I liked it. You, you I liked like watching it. it, and so now this is our first time playing it in a full game this week. And you know we didn't really have a very close game, so it's hard to tell. But um, from watching the men's and the women's worlds, is I I liked what I saw. Cool. So. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Tabitha. Good luck this week. Thanks.